Welcome to the Nightly News. I am Tatiana Watts. One student organization that is leaving their stamp on this month in the campus is Furman Justice Forum. I decided to look into this organization and find out more about them. Furman Justice Forum is an upcoming organization that focuses on social justice and advancing those type of movements. Asha Marie, who was recently elected as student body president, is the leader of the club. But Furman Justice Forum is a relatively new student organization. I inherited it from one of my friends and peer mentors, Davis Kauser. Um, he was super interested in things like law, like a different kind of justice, social justice than I'm usually interested in. Furman Justice Forum is only two years old officially, but the passion and purpose of this club is a lot older. The organization has implemented a series of events known as Justice Month. Kylie is a member of Furman Justice Forum and its planning committee for this month. This month is a month of programs to make students aware of a bunch of different social justice issues that they might have heard of but don't necessarily know anything deeper than the maybe name of this social justice issue. And then near the end of the month, we are hoping to get students involved in. Justice Month was originally planned to be a Justice Week for the spring of 2020, but due to the coronavirus, those plans were postponed and evolved into something people can enjoy for the month. Speaking of Justice Month, Furman Justice Forum has a month of activities planned. Thursday night, March 18th, there is a CLP titled U.S. System U.S. Justice System and White Supremacy. This CLP will allow students to discuss the racial inequity, inequalities in the justice system. Get the CLP credit on the 19th for the film viewing of Fertile Ground. This CLP is centered around the food justice system and movements that are emerging in response to food insecurity and economic pressures that prevent access to healthy and nutritious and culturally appropriate foods. Another CLP on digital advocacy is on the 22nd. There is a student workshop on eating sustainably on the 23rd. And here is another opportunity to get a CLP credit. Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m., actor, singer, songwriter Brian Terrell Clark will be talking about race and ethnicity in the American past, specifically focusing on his time on Broadway and his role as George Washington in the production of Hamilton. For all you Hamilton fans, this sounds like a pretty cool opportunity. Then next Thursday, March 26th, there is a CLP called Burnout, Unlocking the Stress Cycle, best-selling author and nationally known health educator, Dr. Emily Nagoski will explore the concept of burnout. This lecture will help students examine the way our society has traditionally conceptualized wellness and stress. The speaker will share the science behind the stress response cycle. As we get closer to the end of the semester, be sure to check out some of these CLPs. Podcasts are very popular in a huge industry, and now we have several that are hosted right here on Furman's campus. So our Mike DeRosa took a look into some of them. If you are like me and are looking for time to kill in a long drive, you have probably listened to plenty of podcasts. The first podcast to pop up on our campus was the Class E podcast produced by the Communication Studies students. So about a year ago, Rachel Page, Nick Curcio, along with Professor Sturgill, reached out to me about the opportunity of working on the Class E podcast. The Class E podcast is a part of a partnership between Furman Innovation and Entrepreneurship in the Communications Department. Professor Sturgill sits down and interviews Furman alumni um, that are entrepreneurs who have started their own business and just basically about uh, what they think uh, makes successful entrepreneurs and what advice they have for aspiring entrepreneurs. The success of the podcast is due in part to the planning and production. So each episode starts with me writing the script for the show, which is researching the guest and then coming up with questions about their company and um, about uh, advice they have for uh, aspiring entrepreneurs. After the producers set up for the show, they tape, then edit, and it goes on to iTunes. I've learned so much from this because I've gotten experience not only through, um, you know, basic communication stuff like video editing and filmmaking, uh, but I've also gotten experience writing scripts and uh, collaborating with uh, future guests and just a lot of experience that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. More recently, senior Evan Myers, who is the editor of The Paladin, started the Zoom Uni podcast. I started my campus podcast. It's called Zoom Uni. I uh, started it uh, way back in August now. Wow. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think that. But uh, I basically got together with a professor that I've been close with for four years, uh, Dr. Brent Nelson. We publish it about one episode a week. And uh, it's been really a really fascinating way to 
kind of explore issues that are relevant to campus as well as getting the chance to interview a lot of uh, a lot of you know world leaders or just you know community leaders. The format for the Zoom Uni podcast is a long form interview. What you're generally going to hear on Zoom Uni is a quick intro from me, and we're just going to cut right to uh, right to the interview, and it'll be a 30 to 45 minute interview. Um, usually, you know, with, and it, it just depends. The topic changes week to week. We we initially set out to do interviews, uh, really kind of focused on COVID-19 and campus and how colleges were changing. We also wanted to talk about racial justice and, and other kind of hot topics on campus. Evan and Harris were adamant about how much experience they have gained and how much they have learned from their help in their respective podcasts. They also mentioned their podcasts are easily accessible through social media or on the podcast app. This is Mike DeRosa from Furman Nightly News. Thanks, Mike. I will definitely add those to my podcast playlist. Here are this week's COVID numbers. 20% of the students were tested on campus, 310 in total. The testing resulted in 19 positive, leaving us with a 0.97% positivity rate. We are still operating in the yellow phase, but we are trending towards the purple and more on campus activities. In FUSAB news, starting March 19th, there will be a virtual recipe competition. If you have a stellar recipe, submit, your, submit it for your chance to win prizes. On March 23rd, that will be a virtual competition how-to. If you have a special talent you want to show off, submit your how-to on SyncDen entries for both competitions. Entries for both competitions close next Friday, March 26th. In this week's Did You Know segment, we wanted to introduce you to a very talented paladin, Nathan Northfleet. The junior golfer is a master on paper as he is on the course. Nathan did art as a hobby, but then began producing pieces for his golf team. Most Nathan's drawings are in pen and ink. His top sellers on Etsy are creations of Southern culture, state representation, and maps. Each print ranges anywhere between $30 to $40. For like a while, uh, I, really, I quit doing art um, just because I didn't really enjoy the whole high school aspect of it, being told I had to do. And so then in college, I just got bored picked up a pen and kind of just launched a little bit of a hobby the day for just about 30 minutes a day. Uh, and then some of my teammates saw the work and they really liked it and asked if I'd ever be interested in selling the artwork. Uh, I didn't really think I was that good, but then a few guys encouraged me and their parents started hopping on. And that's when I started producing art for the public. And it's been a fun little ride since then. You can find Nathan's work for purchase on Etsy. The link is in his Instagram bio at pinpoint art. We have lots of fast athletes, but none perhaps faster than Cameron Ponder. Kaylee has that story and more in sports. Kaylee, I can't even imagine running that fast. How about you? Me neither, Tatiana. Apparently, there's only 1,500 people in the world who can run a sub four minute mile. That puts Furman's Cameron Ponder in an elite club. Ponder is Furman's third and most recent distance runner to run a sub four minute mile. Zach Klink has the story. The sub four minute mile is an elusive record for most runners. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's something that up until, you know, Roger Bannister did it at one point in time, people believed it couldn't be done. It was past the human ability to do. Um, and still, I think it's a very special thing. Um, it's very hard. To run a mile in under four minutes. I think it's the one, the one nice thing about it is the one thing in track and field that people know if you say you're a sub four minute miler, even if you're not a runner, you're not attached to it, people understand like, oh, okay, so you were, you were a really good runner. Okay. Cameron Ponder has had that goal for a while now, and he says he worked hard to get there. Um, just this past year, I've had the most consistent training block of my life, and um, my workouts were showing that I could do it, and so, um, my coach just kind of said, hey, like, we have this race. We can set it up for you to try to run 29 seconds a lap to where you can break for So let's go do it. And it happened. So it was awesome. It was a great moment. But Ponder says he couldn't have done it without those who supported him in his journey. Uh, it was insane, man. Like, I, I, I crossed and I saw my, my dad was, like, taking pictures um, on the track. And he's, he's kind of the reason I started running. Um, and we've been talking about, you know, me being on the cusp of doing it. 
And so when I had finished and I, I crossed the line, I saw it, the clock was at 3.59, so I knew I did it. So immediately I just ran over, gave him a big hug. And uh, it's awesome. It was a crazy feeling. It's a feeling that Ponder hopes he can recreate over and over again. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely gave me a low confidence boost for sure. I mean, it kind of just said, like, with, with COVID and everything, I mean, I mentioned, like, I had the most consistent training block in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and during that, you know, when, I mean, we weren't racing, no one was competing in anything. So I just kind of dug my head and trained and trained and trained. So for me to see this jump by run, like, breaking four minutes, it just said, okay, you've made a jump in fitness. Now, now it's now that it's the fun part. You can go out and you know race and race better than you ever have in your life. So I think I've tried to carry that momentum throughout this year, and uh, I think I've done that pretty well. So it's been awesome. And his coaches say it's not just the sub four minute mile that makes Cameron an important member of the team. He was a very very highly touted uh, runner coming out of high school, the number one miler in the country. But man, Furman was the perfect fit, fit for him. He is, uh, you know, a great leader on the team. He might be the happiest kid I've ever met in my life. Even when he has a bad day, he really, that really doesn't have a bad day. And I think that kind of temperament and running where you can always kind of find the positive is part of the reason he's having such a breakout indoor season this year. But it's his work ethic that puts him steps ahead of everyone else. His work ethic is it can't really be talked by anybody. Uh, he does every single thing act, asked of him. But he also does it with some real like rigor and grit. Uh, he does it the right way. He does it with a purpose. And that is exactly what you need if you want to go from being a good runner to a great runner. That was Zach Klink reporting. Down the road, Cameron is pursuing the Olympic trials to reach his Olympic dreams. Now, on to football. ETSU quarterback throws it deep and it's picked off by no other than Darius Kirk. Kears. And this goes for not one, not two, but three interceptions this season. Devin Wynn gets the handoff from Sisson, hits the hole on the zone run, and he goes for 35 yards, making defenders miss left and right. Now this is what you call grown man running right here by Wynn. Easy touchdown run for the score to put the Dins in the lead. Paladin started out slow in the first half, but finished the game with a 17-point comeback to win the game 17-13. And that win puts the football team at 3-1. and one. Junior Hans Sisson is the quarterback leading the charge for the Paladins this whole season. We have him picked for our player of the game. So our team has had uh, really shown a lot of grit recently and a lot of tough, toughness and battling through adversity. Two weeks ago, we were down 24-7 against Sanford in the first half. And uh, we, we came back and won the game in overtime and uh, showed a lot of heart and we showed a lot of fight. Um, and then this past week we were down 0-10 to 10 at halftime against ETSU and in the third quarter we scored 17 straight points and ended up winning the game 17-13. to 13. So I'm really proud of the way our team continues to battle and continues to fight through adversity and we're still looking to have our best game ahead in the future. Be sure to catch Ham Sisson and the rest of your Paladin football team this Saturday for the SOCON Game of the Week matchup against Chattanooga. Now on to our scoreboard. Big high-flying action last week. The football team comes back down 0-2 at half and wins a thrilling 17-13 game. Men's soccer took on ETSU to win 2-1 in overtime. Softball dominates in Paladin fashion against NC, A&T 10-2. Volleyball also wins a conference matchup against Western Carolina 3-1. Softball took on Clemson three times last week and unfortunately lost 0-5, 1-8, and 0-8 to the Tigers. They did win an easy 16-0 game against NC a and Men's tennis lost to Setson 2-5 and a loss to North Florida 1-6. Women's soccer beat in-conference opponent VMI 2-0. Lacrosse wins a high-scoring game against VCU 14-12. Speaking of lacrosse, in its seventh year, Furman Women's Lacrosse has finally found their groove. I took a look into the program to see just how they did it. I think what makes our team different this year versus past years is even though we have a small roster, we all are on the same page and we show up every day with the same goals. Um, there's so much talent on our team. I like, know that we're going to keep building on the culture we've already built at Furman and leave a mark. The team implemented what they call the Purple Principles this year, which will now become tradition for years to come. 
The purple principles really embody where we want to take this program and what we believe we need to get there. It's just a way for our team to define what we want out of this season and what we want out of our teammates. Each girl's stick has these purple hearts which represent their purple principles. And these principles are carried off and onto the field. For the first time in program history, they defeated Liberty University. Liberty was a real sore spot in seasons past and going into it, that's always a game that our team really wants to come out on top. And this year, I think we really embodied what this new program is becoming. And we showed grit and we always fought back and there was not a chance that we were losing that game from the minute we stepped on the field. And I think that shows a new wave of firm lacrosse. The team's next goal, winning the SOCON championship for the first time in program history. All 24 girls are working hard towards that goal and the Fergman community is ready to cheer them on in pursuit of making history. This week is another packed week, starting with women's soccer on Friday, March 19th against Chattanooga at 6. Men's golf will be swinging at the Schenkelm Invitational this weekend, Friday through Sunday. On Saturday, March 20th, women's tennis starts playing at 11 a.m. at Wofford. Football takes on Chattanooga at 12 p.m., while women's lacrosse will be away at Elon at 12 p.m. Softball has a doubleheader at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Men's soccer plays at UNCG at 7 p.m. On Sunday, March 21st, men's soccer plays Samford. Women's volleyball plays at 3 p.m. against Wofford and on Monday at 5. That's all for sports. Make sure to sign up for tickets to support your fellow Paladins. Back to you, Tatiana. Thanks, Kaylee. If you are on Milford Mall on St. Patrick's Day, you probably saw a food stamps pot of gold event. 50 students raced to find prizes ranging from Lucky Charm cereal to AirPods. This is the first time they have held this event. Th that does it for us tonight. Thank you for watching the nightly news. We'll see you next week.